Episode two of Hard Knocks Giants Offseason Edition is in the books. So what did we learn this time? My takeaways on the revelations are coming your way next on the Locked on Giants podcast. You are Locked on Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. This episode of the Locked on Giants podcast is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app and create an account and use the promo code Locked on NFL to get $20 off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Hello, New York Giant fans, and welcome to another edition of the Locked on Giants podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast family, your team every day. I'm your host, Patricia Traina, credentialed member of the New York Giants media for Locked on, as well as for Giants on SI. Find my written work over at si.com slash NFL slash Giants. And as always, welcome on in to my big to my blue crew community members, to my everydayers, to my newcomers and everybody in between. Thank you so much for spending part of your day with us here on the Locked on Giants podcast. And if you're watching on YouTube, please consider subscribing to the channel, liking this video, and don't forget, ring that little notification bell so that whenever I post a new video, you will learn, you will be amongst the first to learn of the new video. So on today's episode, Hard Knocks episode two is in the books. What did we learn? Well, I'm going to go over some of the key points, the key takeaways, and I'm also going to give you some of my um, impressions, some some information that I know of to kind of round out the picture. So before we get into the actual uh, segments, spoiler alerts are in this uh, episode. So if you have not seen the episode of Hard Knocks episode two, and you plan to, maybe you want to come back to this podcast a little later so that you're not spoiled. So just putting that out there for what it's worth. All right. So on today's show, we're going to talk about Saquon Barkley because that was actually uh, a little bit more was revealed on that situation. We're going to talk a little bit about um, the trade that wasn't with the New England Patriots, um, the Giants takeaways on the uh, quarterbacks and the wide receivers, which was a big offseason topic, and a few other little things that'll pop up. So let's get started. We're going to kick things off with the Saquon Barkley story. Now, this is kind of interesting because Saquon Barkley, all along, I always got the impression based on what I was able to, to ascertain when the talks were going on with Barkley and uh, the Giants and, and the Giants and Barkley's agents, I always got the impression that it was a matter of semantics. And by that, I mean, you know, sometimes you could say something and it's interpreted one way and it's really not how it was interpreted. So let's kind of roll back a little bit here. Um, the Giants uh, general manager, Joe Shane, Basically, you know, and I said this in the last episode, he was torn about Barkley. He wanted him back, but yet at the other, uh, on the other hand, you know, he sounded bitter, I thought, about having not gotten a deal done with Barkley last year. Um, he sounded conflicted as far as, you know, what was Barkley's true value. He sounded at times as though he was, I don't know if afraid is the right word, but he was conscious of the fact that he didn't want to um, upset Barkley by offering him a, too low of a value and, you know, disrespecting him. So ultimately, Shane, as we know, decided not to put the franchise tag on Barkley and to let him test the market. So uh, towards the end of episode two, we actually got a little bit more um, information into the conversation that was teased in the uh, trailer as well as a snippet of the conversation Shane had with Barkley's agent, Ed Berry of CAA. So um, here's kind of what, let, let, let's start with um, the conversation with, with the agent. The agent pretty much, you know, said to him when, when Shane was, you know, debating what to do and then finally coming to the conclusion that he was going to let him test the market, the agent basically said to him, look, you know, when you're alone in your room at night, you know, can, can you live with the fact that, you know, you're potentially letting this kid jump? 
You know, this after Shane said, well, you know, I think he's still good. I think he can still help us. But the data says, and the second Shane said, but the data says, that's when you knew he wasn't quite all in on Barkley. And I think Barkley's agent and to an extent the player picked up on that. Because if you're not all in on something, then it's like, okay, what are we doing here? So again, I, I just got the impression that Shane just w at no point was, wasn't, was all in on bringing back Barkley, despite what he said, despite saying all options are still on the table and all that stuff. So we get to the conversation that was teased in the trailer. And um, this was interesting. This is where the semantics come in. Now, remember, Barkley said that the Giants never made him an offer to return. But what I did was I went and I transcribed the uh, conversation that Barkley and Shane had um, on the telephone in the episode. So, you know, Shane, you know, and I'll just read it to you real quick. Shane said, if you really want to be a giant for life and you're interested in staying here and coming back, see what your market is and then have Ed Berry, who's Barkley's agent, come back to us and we'll see if we can come to an agreement. And Barkley said, all right, I appreciate that. Shane then said, okay, does that sound good? And Barkley said, yep. So um, Shane then said to him, can you give me your word on that? Or are you not going to give us a chance? That's what we saw in the trailer. Barkley's response was, well, what do you mean? Like circling back? Shane's, and Shane said, yes. This is where Barkley kind of never really said, yes, I'll give you my word. He said to him in response to, to what Shane said, he goes, I mean, I already told you where I want to be. So, so Shane, at that point, instead of saying, yeah, but Saquon, do we have your word on that? He just said, okay, well, let's do that then. And that was pretty much the end of that conversation. So Barkley, again, if you're talking semantics, never came out and said to the Giants, yes, I'm going to give you my word to give you an opportunity to match the deal. So here's the thing, folks. Saquon goes out to the market. He gets this deal from the Philadelphia Eagles. And if you're Saquon's agent, you're saying, okay, you know what? The Giants didn't want to start off with, with, with uh, you know, the franchise tag. You know, they didn't want to tag you. They didn't want to give you an APY, you know, at, at least 12 million, which I think is what the tag was. The Eagles come in with this offer. And, you know, at that point, if you know that the Giants don't want to spend more than 10 million on, on you, which I think, you know, was kind of conveyed throughout the whole process. Why even bother going back to the Giants just to say, hey, we got this offer for 13, you know, 13, 14 million a year from the Eagles. You want to match it? I mean, I think at that point, maybe Barkley and his agent knew that the Giants weren't going to match it. So they probably figured, okay, why even bother? Based on, again, this was based on, you know, previous offers that, or previous discussions, I should say, that were made this year, not last year, this year. Okay. I know last year the Giants offered Barkley, you know, upwards of 14 million APY and he turned that down. So, you know, that whole episode, I think, left a bitter taste in Joe Shane's mouth. So, end of the day, Barkley goes to the Eagles. You know, I'm sure that broke John Mara's heart. I'm sure, you know, Shane you know, sat there and shook his head, you know, he, at one point in the episode, uh, prior to that scene, he was like, well, you know, I offered him, you know, a lot of money to stay. And in a couple of years, he'll get his name on in the ring of honor and so on and so forth. And he turned it down. So there was still that bitterness of not getting something done the year before. Um, and then you, uh, again, you come to this year and if you, you know, the bottom line, if you really want to make something happen, you find a way. You don't just say, oh, okay, go out there and see what's better and come back. If I'm Barkley, all right, if I'm in Barkley's shoes and, you know, the Giants say that to me, they say, oh, we're going to let you test the market because we're really not sure what you're worth to us. That's kind of an insult. I can see where Barkley might take that as an insult. And I say, okay, you know what? If you don't value me enough to make me an offer for this year, based on what I've done for you, you know, the last year, you know, you're telling me I'm your best player and you don't think enough of me. Guess what guys? See ya. So that's what I think might've been, um, in, in, in his, uh, his thought process. So that being said, you know, I, I don't know if we're going to get more 
on the Saquon Barkley situation. I would imagine maybe we'll, we'll get a call at some point, you know, in another episode in which Bar the Giants are are told that Barkley's going with Philadelphia and we'll get the reactions and stuff like that because I would think that would make for good TV. But that was the crux of the situation and it kind of played out um, sort of like I had heard it was, where it was a matter of semantics. And Barkley, who, by the way, was named, I think, number 95 or 94, I can't remember what it was, but Barkley was named to the to, to the Giants' all-time 100 top players list. You know, the Giants releasing the first 10 uh, from numbers 91 to 100. And I think Barkley was was uh, in the high 90s there. Um, Ex-Giant. So a little bit of bitterness, I think, on their part, Barkley's part, you know, because again, the Giants, you know, Joe Shane decided to let the market dictate what he would pay Barkley because he just wasn't sure or he didn't want to commit. And I don't know. I've never been a fan of GMs who let the market dictate to them what a player is worth. I mean, if a player is that important to you, you make it work. You find a common ground and you make it work. And I know some of you are going to say, well, he tried with Saquon. But, you know, there had to be a middle ground. And I get it that, you know, there were too many uh, free agent needs that they needed to address, that they that they wanted to address, and they couldn't afford to spend a, a lot of money. And, you know, Devin Singletary, they got a pretty good deal on him, I think. But I'm curious to see how this go this plays out in the coming season. All right, coming up next, first round draft trades. What was the story behind the Giants reportedly looking to trade with the New England Patriots? Was that fact or fiction? We're going to talk about that and then some right after this. Hey, Giant fans, there's so much going on these days in the area with baseball, concerts, shows, and pretty soon the return of football, hockey, and basketball. And if you're worried about getting shut out of your favorite events, worry no more because with Game Time, well, they've got you covered. Game Time offers a large selection of seats at competitive prices, clear seat views, event cancellation protection, last minute money saving opportunities, and easy online ordering. Plus, if you find your tickets elsewhere in the same section and row for less, Game Time will give you 110% of the difference. So go on and get the event tickets that you've been wanting. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the promo code Lockdown NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Terms apply. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Locked on Giants podcast. I'm your host, Patricia Chena, and we are recapping episode two of Hard Knocks. There was quite a lot in this episode, very interesting episode, and I'm giving you, you know, some spoilers. So again, if you're at this point, you're starting at this point in the podcast and you haven't seen the episode, there are spoilers in this, this show, but I'm giving you an additional takeaway, stuff that, you know, I, I think maybe add a little bit more context to what we saw in the edited version of Hard Knocks. So that is what we were doing. And in this segment, we're going to talk about the draft a little bit because there was a great deal spent in the episode on the combine, which is where, you know, a lot of trades, a lot of, you know, transactions and stuff are born. And it's interesting because the Giants, before they, they actually got to the combine, they held personnel meetings in which their scouts pretty much sat around the table and they talked about the top quarterback prospects, the top receiver prospects, and basically who they are as people, you know, a little bit of background on the football stuff, but basically who they are as people. And, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. They did the quarterbacks first and of the quarterbacks that they mentioned on the show, they talked about um, Jaden Daniels. They talked about Drake May, J.J. McCarthy, Caleb Williams. Um, I got the impression that of those four, they were least enthusiastic about Daniels. You know, the, Scott Hamill, who's one of their area scouts, noted that Daniels, you know, is a three-time captain, but not someone who was much of a vocal leader. Um, and also, you know, suggested that it was important to get a feel for Daniels, you know, putting him on the spot and see how, you know, he responded to the football stuff. And later on in the episode, 
we actually saw, <clears throat> excuse me, Brian Dable during, during um, Daniels' interview put the kid on the spot where, you know, he would talk about a favorite play and then he would ch change the play up on the kid and then they'd move off of the topic and the table would go, Oh, by the way, give me back that play without looking at the whiteboard that I, that we talked about just a few minutes ago and twice Daniels didn't get it correct. So, I mean, just a little insight there. And, you know, I think the one quarterback and, and this was kind of um, I guess proven later on that they really liked was Drake May out of North Carolina and uh, Patrick Hanscom, who was a, another uh, college area scout for the Giants, made note of the fact that, you know, May is very similar to Daniel Jones, except maybe has a little looser personality. Um, also predicted that May's football character and mental part of his games were probably going to grade out high. Um, McCarthy, you know, they talked a little bit about him and, you know, the fact that his offensive line basically made all the protection calls, but McCarthy had the, the right to overrule that. And then they talked a little bit about Caleb Williams and whether or not, you know, he would be a fit for the New York market. And, you know, but otherwise everything would kind of check out. But let's go back to Drake May, because that was the guy who, you know, was very who was rumored to be the apple of the Giants eye so much so that they wanted to trade up with the New England Patriots, who held third overall pick in the draft. So we learned from the episode that Joe Shane actually paid a visit to the new England suite, which ironically was all the way on the opposite end of where the giant suite was in, um, in, in the uh, Lucas oil stadium for the combine. So Shane basically went over to, um, to, to the Patriots and he had a conversation with Elliot Wolf. Uh, and he basically said to him, look, you know, if you're thinking about doing anything at number three, give me a call because I'm interested. Um, so the way it was edited, it looks like the Giants made the first move on uh, Drake May or, or not Drake May, but to move up with the Patriots. And of course, Elliot Wolf said, well, you know, I've gotten calls from a couple of other teams, one of whom we later found out was the Vikings. I don't know who the other team was. Um, and as we all know, the Patriots did not move. They were, they were, they had their eye on Drake May and they were just not going to move. And, and it was pretty evident because, you know, you look at what the Vikings reportedly offered them, which was, I think both number ones. And I think that another high draft pick the following year and the Patriots said, no, the giants offer two number ones, one this year, one next year. And the Patriots said no. So the Patriots were never looking to move out of that number three spot. That was pretty obvious. And, you know, again, when it came out from uh, during the draft that, you know, the, what the Giants had offered, what the Vikings had offered, you, you, you just knew that the Patriots were like, nah, you know, I mean, maybe they were looking for a Ricky Williams type of uh, trade where, you know, maybe the Giants had they said to them, well, you know what, we'll give you our entire draft class for the right to move up. Maybe that would have moved the needle, but I, I doubt it. I mean, I never got the impression that the Patriots were going to move up and or move out of that spot rather. And, and sure enough, they didn't. So, uh, but again, Shane went over and initiated those talks and, you know, I, I don't know how much more of the talks we're going to see in the coming, uh, the, the remaining three episodes, I would imagine we may see some, something of the offer, you know, now that, now that it's out there and we know that the giants went to the Patriots. So maybe we'll find out the exact offer. But, um, but yeah, that was, uh, you know, that was a kind of a revelation there. All right. Um, now I mentioned that, um, the giants also looked at the top receivers in the draft. That would of course have been Malik neighbors, Marvin Harrison jr. And Roma Dunze. And going back to the scouting meetings that they had, you know, um, Harrison was praised, for not having an ego despite his pedigree. Adunze uh, was, was uh, considered an alpha male and a high energy guy who was capable of taking over a room. And then you got to Neighbors, who of course was the Giants first round pick. And um, he was described as being quote, highly passionate and competitive end quote, and someone with quote, a big time chip on his shoulder. Um, and then the scout that was presenting 
um, his his background on on uh, neighbors, which was um, I believe it was. Let me see, it was Hamill. It was um, Scott Hamill. That's right, Scott Hamill, who's one of the area scouts. So Scott Hamill basically said, "Look, he likes his targets, and you will hear about it if he doesn't get his targets." And you know. Hamill uh, concluded that, hey, we need to get around this kid to see if we can work with him because there's a lot to his personality. So fast forward now to the combine and they have the players coming in for their interviews. And right off the bat, you could tell that Brian Dable, the head coach, who, by the way, remember, is probably going to take over the play calling this year. So, you know, obviously he's going to have an even bigger say in the whole process you could tell he took a liking to Malik Neighbors, to his competitive spirit, to, you know, the X's and O's stuff, just, just everything about it. Now, Neighbors, you know, was asked by Dabo, hey, you know, what happens if you don't get the ball a lot? You know, what happens if you don't win? And the kid answered the questions as best he can. He's like, hey, you know, I'd be disappointed if I didn't get the ball because I work hard. Um, I don't like losing. And that's all stuff that Dabo liked. But Dable also told him in the clip that was aired, you know, harness some of that because look, you don't want a situation where you have a receiver who now makes it about him and not about the team. So in other words, if, you know, neighbors comes in and one week he doesn't get targeted at all, doubt that happens, but let's say he doesn't get targeted. Is he going to whine to the press that he didn't get targeted? That's what the Giants, I think, have to keep an eye on. And I think that's why Dable was telling the kid in the, in the uh, meeting room, hey, harness some of that back, you know, pull some of that back. You know, it's good that you hate to lose. It's good that you want the ball, but you can't let that consume you to the point where maybe it becomes a distraction. So that's something you definitely want to keep an eye on as we go through. Now, so far, since he's been here, Malik Neighbors has said all the right things. He's done all the right things. He's drawn high praise from his teammates, but that's something to keep an eye on moving forward. Um, hopefully it won't be an issue with him, but you know, we'll see. I, I think he'll be fine, but um, again, something to keep an eye on with Malik neighbors who uh, also in that episode, Dable just basically came out and he said, yep, I spent all day watching film on this kid and I really like him. So you kind of figured that Malik Neighbors was Dable's choice over, you know, once Marvin Harrison went off the board uh, before the Giants went on the clock, it came down to Roma Dunze and Malik Neighbors. And as far as Dable was concerned, they were going Malik Neighbors all day, every day. So that's a little background in that situation. All right. Now coming up next, some remaining takeaways, including a couple of nuggets that came up in the teaser for episode number three. Don't go anywhere. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Locked on Giants podcast. I'm your host, Patricia Trena, and we are talking Hard Knocks, episode two. What did we learn? What are the takeaways and so forth? I thought it was a really good episode, a lot better, I think, than the first one, which was kind of an introductory type of episode. But uh, we're going over these last few little nuggets that I pulled out from the uh, episode. And by the way, you can read my full report on this episode over on Giants on SI. Again, that URL is si.com slash NFL slash Giants. And coming up, by the way, on the Locked on Giants podcast later this week, I'm going to have the two show for, uh, forerunners um, on, the, on the program, Paul and Emily. They're going to come on. We're going to get a little behind the scenes stuff, how they put the show together, you know, the logistics, all that good stuff. So I'm looking forward to that discussion that's going to be coming up later on this week. All right. Some remaining takeaways from this episode. It's kind of interesting. Um, at the combine, the Giants coaches, the assistant coaches, some of them were involved with running the drills. And you saw a clip of Jerome Henderson, the defensive backs coach, greeting Andrew Phillips of Kentucky with a big hug and a, and a warm greeting. And, you know, sure enough, we all know that the Giants ended up drafting him. Um, he was their third round pick. So that was a little foreshadowing of what was to come. You saw um, Shane Bowen, um, you know, talking about Tyler Newbin, the Giants second round pick. 
That was a little bit of a foreshadow. Uh, so yeah, you, you saw some of that stuff and, you know, but I want to go to the Brian Burns trade because that was kind of revisited a little bit. Now, thus far in this episode, we really haven't heard a whole lot regarding Xavier McKinney, the safety. And pretty much, you know, it was confirmed by, I think, I want to say it was, um, was it Tim McDonald? or It might have been Chris Rossetti. I'm sorry. So I, I believe Chris Rossetti basically said, look, if we go with the edge rusher, whether it be Christian, you know, Wilkins or, or Brian Burns, we could pretty much forget about McKinney, resigning McKinney. And, you know, I think I said this last week, I'll say it again. I always was under the impression, even going back to the start of last season, that McKinney was not going to be back with the Giants. All right. I had someone tell me that, that, you know, would obviously know what the, what the young man's plans were. And I never got the impression that he was going to be back. So that being said, you know, the Giants, they decided, okay, you know what? Do we take the edge rusher or do we take a safety? They decided to go with the edge rusher and let McKinney walk and instead replace him with Newbin, whom they like in the, um, in the draft class. So let's talk now a little bit about Burns. So we didn't really get into the, the nitty gritty in this episode. You know, the first episode we saw kind of like some initial conversation that Joe Shane had with Dan Morgan the uh, GM at Carolina and in the previews for episode three, you actually saw a clip of Shane on the phone with Dan Morgan in which he goes, come on, man, you want a seventh on top of everything? You know, I need players too. So it sounded like Morgan was trying to squeeze the giants a little bit more with, um, with regards to, to swapping burns. So Shane held his water held his ground and he managed to get him not for a first round pick, which is what the um, Panthers initially wanted as part of the deal, but for a second and a fifth next year, which if you think about it is what the giants got for Leonard Williams. So I wonder if maybe at some point in this episode, we're going to get a, a taste of that, you know, where, you know, Shane says to Morgan, Hey, you know, I got a second and a fifth, you know, for, for Leonard Williams, who, who has, you know, more tread, but, you know, more production than Burns, you know, so why can't we do something similar? I wonder if that's not going to pop up at some point. And if it does, you know, if what uh, Morgan's reaction was for that. So uh, you have that, um, you know, also Shane realized that if they went and they um, acquired Brian Burns, that their odds of getting a cornerback a veteran cornerback, which remember they tried to do in free agency with the hopes of maybe getting somebody who would be reasonable in their salary demands. Shane kind of joked. He said, well, I guess I'll play corner then, you know, so he kind of laughed about it. But remember the giants tried to get uh Tredavious white, Darius Williams, Steven Nelson, all veteran cornerbacks who could have stepped in right away and started at that cornerback two spot opposite of Deontay Banks. And, you know, when all that else failed, you know, the Giants, they didn't draft a cornerback um, to play on the outside. They drafted Drew Phillips, who, like I said, was a slot cornerback. All of a sudden they pivoted and they said, okay, well, you know what? We've got confidence in Cordell Flott because what else were they going to say at that point, right? So they decided to roll with Cordell Flott. Now we'll see if that continues or if the Giants, you know, at some point, during the next several weeks, once they get into training camp in the preseason, do they need to pivot and go in a different direction? So that was the other um, main takeaway. And we will see obviously a little bit more of that once we get into um, episode three, but that was teased as part of episode two. So I'm throwing that little crumb in there. All right. So overall, again, great episode, very insightful. Um, a lot of stuff kind of aligned. Gave, gave a little backstory to some of the key storylines. Um, so that's going to do it for this edition of Locked on Giants. And I hope you enjoyed it as always. So make sure you keep it here all week long. We've got more episodes coming up here on the Locked on Giants podcast. And we will see you tomorrow.